from a man who lived very close to the boyhood uh, residence of Lee, went to Washington and Lee, went through West Point where the near perfect cadet Lee was memorialized. Tell me about the day Annie comes to you and says, Stan, I think you should take that portrait of Robert E. Lee off the wall. It was um, pretty soon after Charlottesville in 2017. And uh, we'd both been really disgusted by what we see. My family was from the South, and so I had, had a lot of uh, feelings about that. Annie came to me and said, I think you should take the lead picture and get rid of it. And she had given it to me 40 years before. I had it in our quarters and house. I was a second lieutenant when she took 25 bucks, which we didn't have a lot of money, and bought it for me, and I treasured it. And I was proud when I, in the house when I saw it because I said, that's my hero. I'm, if I could be anything like him, that would be great. And I was proud when people came to the house and saw it because they saw who my hero is and they go, well, Stan's trying to be somebody um, that's admirable. So I resisted her. It took about a month of back and forth conversations and I said, he wasn't political. She says, doesn't matter. People equate his image now with something that you don't support, white supremacy. And I go, well, that's true, that's their problem. She says, no, it's our problem, because if someone comes in our home, they're not gonna ask you about it. They're not gonna say, I see the picture of Lee, Stan, are you a white supremacist? They're not gonna say that. But they may walk out just thinking, Stan is subtly sending a message mm. of something. And you know, after about a month, I thought and thought about it, I concluded she was right. So on a Sunday morning, I went into my little office and I, took it down and took it out to the trash and threw it away. And it was not an unemotional moment for me because I felt disloyal. I felt also weak because I said, I'm doing this just because the headlines about Charlottesville came out. If I was really a strong person, if I believed in when I'm 20 and when I was 40, now that I'm 63, I shouldn't waver in the wind. But you know, we all need to grow. And what I realized was, as I studied him more, as I thought about it more, as I processed things more, I wasn't doing it because it was popular in the moment. I was doing it because I had been pulled along to a conf conclusion that I just never thought about before. I'd never thought about Lee in the context of being a traitor to his nation. They, they have paintings of him, and I lived in Lee Barracks. Um, he was just a person worthy of emulation. And yet, when we studied him for the book, the profile, it took a year to write that profile because I wanted to get it just right in how I felt about it. Because I still admire so much about Robert E. Lee. There's so much about him I would like to be. But when he had the most important decision of his life in the spring of 1861, he got it wrong. Right. I mean, he got it dead wrong. The moral issue of the 19th century, he's on the wrong side. And he had plenty of time to think about it. Right. And I can't forgive him for that, but it's not me to forgive him. It's more important for me to understand, guess what, Lee isn't perfect. He's not a statue, he's not a painting, he's a man. He makes mistakes, he's like me, I make mistakes. He's like all of us, we have flaws. And so he went from being this mythological depiction to being a human being. Right. And in many ways, that's a lot healthier way to look at leaders. Mm -hmm. Because if we think of them as on the pedestal and perfect, we're invariably gonna be wrong and often disappointed by it.